Welcome back to our third session. Our third session is concerned with a section of the exhibition which is about uh, human, non-human ecologies, systems, uh, transspecies relationship. Uh, sorry. Okay. And we have a first trio here by A Orienté Objet, which is a French group working since the last more than 20 years on, not a, well, 91. Okay, not yet. Nearly 20 years. Yeah, well, 20 more. Yeah. <laughs> About transspecies relationships, ecology, and also the questioning of scientific tools and methods. And on the other hand, uh, Robert Ruth Bernstein has been a professor in the Department of Physiology and the Lyman Briggs College here at Michigan State University since 1987. And there was an interesting dialogue when Marion and uh, Benoit came here for the first time and the shared discussion about not only the materiality but also the metaphoricity of immunology. And what does it mean to be allergic to somebody? How can the other invade our bodies? How, uh, how we can scale up and down uh, what is happening on the scale of an individual organism down to physiological molecular processes. And we have another kind of scaling up and down also here on the right side of the table that will be then a discussion also involving Kua Shen and Linda Hansen that are more interested also in communal networks and symbiotic relationships that connect species. So for the first part, I would like to mention that the work that is on display here by A. Henri Objet is called Que le cheval vive en moi, so that the horse may live in me, which is an extreme biological self-experimentation and that is very much about a kind of transspecies uh, blood transfusion to become blood brothers beyond human species with otherness, you know, to make it short. So it's a very philosophical project, it's a very ecological project, but it's also a kind of immunological project which is very much um, scratching our self-understanding what we are as human beings. So I would like to first start due to elaborate a little bit on the projects that precisely have been doing uh, with human-animal relationships. And the discussions that you have had with Bob around that, um, especially in the realm of microbiome research, which is, as I understand, connect both your fields of research, be it artistic or scientific. So, the floor is yours. May you start with your first image? Yep. Um, yeah, okay. Um, so, um, I, I would like to, uh, I, I will first talk and then uh, mainly about the project that you can see in the exhibition. And then Marion will, um, will continue with uh, a sort of continuation of the discussion we had uh, three years ago with um, Rob. Uh, so uh, way behind, our topic could be resumed into two, um, um, two thematics. One would be the self and the other, and also the experimentation on, on us. Although concerning the horse, it is, uh, to be honest, been an experimentation, especially on Marion, but I was the experiment. Um, so this, uh, this is um, to, to start an artist skin culture that we made uh, a, far, um, a long time ago in 1997, which was the first attempt to uh, getting out of our bodies through uh, the possibility we had to cultivate our own skin and to um, get it out uh, from our bodies and craft it on the pork stem and use it as a support for, um, for uh, an image, for several images of animals. So that was the first confrontation, but outside of the bodies. And this was chosen, of course, because it drives, uh, drives us to the, to, the, um, to the horse project. So May the Horse Live in Me was, as, uh, um, as Jens uh, stated, um, the result of a long uh, research, biological, for us, which, is, which was very interesting, is that it's, it was both 
both uh, um, ethological commitment and biological commitment. So uh, we started with the, uh, the biological uh, commitment, which was the possibility of compatibilize horse blood so that we could inject it uh, into Marion's body during the performance. So I will not, uh, you, you have uh, a lot of explanations already in the slides, so I will not read, read them for you, you can read them. Um, but just to say that it was a, a quite long, three years long process to see how we could do this compatibilization. Of course, first retrieving all the red parts, but also uh, see, uh, knowing what we could uh, keep in uh, and mostly immunoglobulins. Um, the one we would have to avoid, for example, the one uh, targeting the heart and uh, keeping only the one uh, which, uh, even if nothing is sure in this uh, sort of experiment, could avoid uh, the most dangerous aspects uh, of it. So, uh, oh, why this? Um, you jumped to the end already? I don't know. I, I, don't know. I, I thought it was... I don't know. Yeah, many slides? Okay. So, but, well, basically, you have the material. If you, well, it's probably a, a sort of trailer to force you to go and see the exhibition because you have more images to, uh, <laughs> to have a hint of the performance. Um, but basically, uh, you have no image of the performance itself? Um, no, the mm -hmm. image is. Um, So it's really a trailer. Okay. Um, so I, I won't. Um... So yeah, maybe I can go on. Um, <coughs> before. Oh, uh, okay. Before trying this experiment, we had lots of things unknown. Uh, what quantity of blood we should use, and the variety of uh, elements, and what would be the chain effect. So it was very unknown. And Actually, just before, no one succeeded in doing it with harness. So, wow, and this is so far. Is that better? Yeah, it's yeah. better. <laughs> So it was still a quite a dangerous experiment, but um, so we had to have uh, a link to an hospital doing it in case it would turn bad, uh, and, and especially in terms of allergy, because you're not supposed to have so many um, in, um, moles and, and immunoglobulins introduced in your body once, all in a shot. Uh, that's why before you had to have this mitralization that means having each of the different family uh, taken separately month after month so that the body would not react hardly, having them all together. Um, and of course this also means that I had to work on my uh, inflammatory terrain, that means uh, not to eat meat, alcohol, sugar for three years and, and be able to have a very alkaline body so that it would not be too reactive. Um, so this was a long-term job and it was very important for us to do it not only on purpose of a theoretical purpose but also to work on the, the way it could change the consciousness we had since um, probably having horse blood in, in my body would make me less primate and have weird reactions that would not be the traditional one of a human. Um, we also, uh, during the, the, the performance, we also took my blood to lyophilize it so that it would become a kind of uh, hybrid, hybrids, hybrids blood center's blood because just 20 minutes after the experiment I would have the maximum quantity of horse immunoglobulin in my own blood. And this is a kind of interesting, um, uh, quite religious proof of, of this mixed blood um, that would uh, be conserved. 
And of course, it was a way to experiment this crazy uh, plausibility of the myth of the center, which is always, it's so funny to have our culture uh, based on, on crazy Greek stories in which everyone is mixed with someone else. And, and we have no way to think that today. So it was also a kind of uh, uh, going on with this uh, legend and mythology. Yeah, here is uh, some of the important thing for us, you know. Um, what is being a multi-personality, hybrid person? Uh, what would be uh, to assume another personality? And here are all the questions that rise uh, doing this, showing the capacity for empathic and fusional relationship with a perfectly foreign species. And becoming another, as I said, I had very re weird reactions like feeling at the same time very um, sensitive and, and, and nervous, but at the same time very powerful and, and could not sleep more than two hours. Lots of things that were absolutely uh, different from my own um, perception, traditional perception. And, um, of course, there are also problems of thinking the interspecific barrier concept, which is um, something very uh, touchy today, because you have this problem of awareness of what is the animal and what should be done or not with this practice we had uh, with the animal, which are very, uh, ethically speaking, difficult to bear with. Um, yeah, all those questions raised, and, and um, I think this was what was interesting, philosophically speaking, uh, with this experiment. Then um, it challenged the, the way we think, um, our bodies and my body especially, in terms of immunology, but also in terms of being another. And um, that's why, it, uh, after discussing with Ruth here, um, there was a new um, important thing coming into the science, which was the study of the microbiota. And for us, it was very interesting to understand if something could be done from these studies. So um, I started another, uh, well, it's, uh, I made research, anthropological research, for years on the pygmy rituals in Gabon, Cameroon, and Congo. Um, and, and we entered this right long time ago um, on research purpose, but also in, with the aim of, uh, revert, of, of revert the globalization. I mean, just now the globalization is always going in one direction. Um, Africa, for example, is invaded by American, French, European stuff uh, and objects. And we are not very touched by the African culture today. So it was very important for us to study this reversibility and being able to have a replacement of our very um, standard occidental um, uh, culture uh, by a more uh, diverse culture, taking into account that kind of uh, rituals and way of life. So we've been in this um, uh, British stuff, but the problem was also going maybe further. And for example, um, there are strong beliefs today about the microbiota, that the most diverse microbiota a human can have, the best it is. This is something that everyone think in, in the microbiota studies. Um, unfortunately, I think it's totally uh, crazy thinking that way because if you look at people living in um, the wild rainforest where you have the maximum uh, quantity of uh, microbes in your uh, body, well, at least they live much uh, less longer than, than we do in the northern country. So that means it's not necessarily the best way to live, and, and it goes with a lot of sickness. But we still have this idea of we should have many microbes in our body to be alive well, which I think is quite crazy after having done this experiment, which was, um, yeah, you see there are lots of 
imagination about the way uh, well, this, these are more proved, some are, some not. Some, not. Um, some microbes might give uh, black moods, melancholia, and so on. We, we discovered, for example, that uh, some provotella were very important in um, depression states. So I decided to become a pygmy myself by... Um, uh, grafting a pygmy microbiota in my body, which was uh, the last um, step I could do to be um, a pygmy. I mean, we, if, you, if you enter the pygmy's rituals, you are one of them in terms of religion and family. But then what to be one of them like living in the forest the same way that they are, having the same kind of microbes. So I did this. And uh, here you can see the traditional um, uh, analysis made by uh, Rob Knight in San Diego on microbiotas. And there is a specifically in the middle of the shims, one showing uh, I should be as a dark point. In the middle of it, the red point is France. So I should be around that, but I'm not even in the picture. <laughs> that means after being a pygmy, even if my microbiota is still there, it's so different from being a French that I'm not even um, into the schema, which is very interesting for me. And then I discovered with all the families of the microbes that uh, I've been really invaded by this experiment of um, pygmy graft. So that means I was not uh, even um, possibly analyzed by the, the traditional uh, American uh, studies of microbiota, because that kind of, uh, of microbes I had, new ones, were not referred uh, many, uh, many times in their own tablets. Like I had succini vibrio, and no one knows that in this uh, normal microbiotes. So this is the traditional transplantation system uh, that are used in Europe and in the States, meaning you have um, frozen material and then syringe to uh, get it. And of course, this is the pygmy way, which is <laughs> much more crafted um, because it's, I mean, there are no grafting in a, I mean, hospital way, it's just, direct in the forest. And um, actually, it's not that far away from their tradition, because there are some babies that sometimes get sick. And uh, they already had in their tradition the idea of giving the microbiote of the mother to the baby if it was not well transplanted. So this is a very old fashioned thing, even for them. So that made my, my uh, body totally crazy, I must say. And um, I had an autoimmune disease before, which is very common today. Um, but it was very interesting to, 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 to do this kind of experiment because it gave me an even worse uh, autoimmune situation, which was, I think, the way I could cure my immune my autoimmune disease today, because I could see the link very, very precisely of the different microbes that were in my body causing the autoimmune disease that disappeared when I just get rid of them. So it's, um, what was interesting in this aggravation was to, to see there was a link, very precise link between the microbes and the autoimmune reaction uh, uh, levels. Um, then, how could we do this? Um, we, we could only do this uh, passing by the visualization. Or, and the visualization on the, of the microbes today does not exist anymore because people just have genetical prints of them, which are very um, ab abstract. And we found someone who was uh, the last biologist, got him to retire, <laughs> able to take micro pictures of uh, bad, um, uh, of the microbiotes. 
And so this is a picture of it that gave landscape we did from microbiote, which are made by, with, with um, natural elements from the pygmy uh, forest and to recreate images, you know, of this microbiota. And of course, it gave an artwork, which is uh, a reference to Piero Manzoni artist sheet, because now we did the artist sheet at the time of globalization, which is very different, because Piero Manzoni died very early, and he did this fantastic work, which now leaks a lot, because um, it's still uh, work inside the boxes, and there are, there are lots of discussions, should we keep that kind of work in their boxes, sterilize it, put it in other boxes because it stinks, and so on. And, and so we did one uh, because he didn't travel much, Piero Manzoni, and the fact that we are traveling a lot make us new person, probably the worst person ever in terms of, of autoimmune disease. <laughs> And, and so we, we did this, um, this new uh, artist sheet, which is, which is probably very different from the, from the one of, of Manzoni. Yeah, and then arise many other questions. How to create a physiological link with an endangered ecosystem? Um, how to allow his symbolic survival in the artist? So that means I'm not, I'm not anymore only a um, French traditional person, but someone mixed. Except I had to work on that to make my health better. <laughs> then questions on the physiological dimension of globalization and its consequences, because I'm sure that actually the rise of those autoimmune disease is really due to the transportation and tourism, massive tourist. And how to produce a symbolic action likely to question the disappearance of forest ecosystems due to an action of multinational, of course, because probably the pygmies will disappear soon, and this is a big problem. Um, and of course, to get rid of this notion and of interethnicity. That means before uh, we, we, we worked on these interspecies um, boundaries with the horse, and now it's more about uh, stopping to consider humans so different. So I think, yeah, after it's something very different, so maybe we'll let uh, our friend, if he comes back. <laughs> but maybe the image that you have just been showing is evocative of a project that you initially had in mind to come here and also push further, uh, a project that is consisting of manipulating lab mice in a way that they reproduce the order of sainthood by manipulating the microbiome. I mean, this is also very interesting uh, art historical research, what kind of resources you have been studying in order to depict uh, to find out how this smell that is uh, apparently being ascribed to saints in the history would have been smelling? I mean, how, how, how is it transcribed? How people do talk about what kind of violet like aromas come to mind of people having smelled saints? Maybe. Yeah, what, what was very funny was this new project that we are uh, almost to end today. I mean, it's it's quite uh, almost finished, um, is that uh, we discovered that in the 19th century you had people already discussing about finding the way sanctity odor was made of. So there were little uh, scientific society um, having meetings to think about that. And, and it has been described anthropologically a lot. Um, something between violet and jasmine and, and amber. And so we, we just, um, we just uh, wrote all those formulas about what was supposed to be the most common um, biological uh, aspects of this odor. And, and so we, we first thought maybe we could find an endocrine 
uh, an endocrinian way to to describe it. So we thought maybe it could be ketosis of uh, diabetic acetomania. Um, but it didn't work out. We could not find a way, the endocrine way. So we, we went to the microbiote again and, and to synthetic biology, thinking that we could obtain ionons by a work of uh, biosynthesis of the diogenous enzymes. That, that means taking an E. coli and transform uh, the biochemistry, the traditional biochemistry, so that instead of um, smelling shit, because in dolls, I mean dolls which are very uh, bad smelling, it would smell like violet. So it's, it's a very, it was a very long-term project too because it took uh, three years to realize the 19 successive steps of uh, genetic manipulation to obtain the strains. And of course, to have it um, smell the right way, we would now need to make an in vivo experiment in which we'll use uh, necessarily an axenic mice, that means a mice that has no uh, microbiota at all, uh, so that it would smell, smell um, a good way. Which for us, it's quite interesting because this is a later, it's like a kind of church you must know that, of course, in the traditional uh, art history, um, the mice is the symbol of the evil. So this is, for example, um, a painting from the 15th century in which you see Joseph um, making a mice trap Trans. to avoid the evil touching uh, the Holy Mary and the Christ. So this is, this is always the representation of uh, protection against, against the evilly poor uh, mice. <laughs> and of course for us, um, the mice became uh, a, um, a saint because it's just the, the most useful animal in, in re, ah, scientific research. And so, um, yeah, here we are. We are supposed now to go on. So this is again um, a project that is very political and tricky because for people that means we will have connection between science and religion, of course, because how far do we have to go to understand the living thing? Is it uh, dangerous or not? This is very important to us, for us to ask and to deal with these questions. So as we come back to Rob, hopefully very soon, I mean, one question, because we discussed this at this table, maybe you can share this question. How many artists in the last years not only have been shifting their practices from working with cells, with uh, genetic material as placeholders of their own identity towards in-between organisms, such as viruses, for example, in the case of Tani's work, or bacteria at large and microbiota are very massively now. And in how far also there's a kind of tendency to make this link between scientific belief and religious belief. So we have traced a lot of projects that deal with that. A Canadian artist licking surfaces of, um, um, of, of, of icons. icons and other religious objects and uh, trying to find out and how far this, uh, this touchy a presence of other people having touched the same object make change their mi microbiome. There's a Russian artist right now also uh, making a lot of uh, analysis of uh, the bacterial colonies on Russian icons and the Orthodox shirt. So it's a lot of interesting uh, research going on, but why belief systems in science and religion are put together? What was your motivation? Hmm. Well, this is complex. I think first the, the new ethics yeah. Very oh. okay. Ethics on, on, uh, in scientific research is very much inspired by the general ethics, uh, which, are, which is also um, inspired by the religion at the start. So um, this is very interesting to question. Is that the right ethics we, have, we are having um, uh, to, to wonder about uh, the rightness or not of what we're doing in science. So this is, this is um, 
For us, it was, it, I think it's very important. There are more and more um, necessities of um, using ethics committee to know if we have the right to do that kind of art. And most of the time, it doesn't even work because um, the, the artistic uh, uh, desires are totally different from the scientific one. And so they don't have the right questions in, in, um, in their committee, so they never can stop the work, which is very interesting, because just they didn't think about that kind of aim we had. And, and so we've never been uh, stopped that way. But then we've been stopped in other way, like for example, this mice, um, we were supposed to realize it um, in the INRA system in France, which is a, a traditional research center for uh, agriculture and animals. And they have a wonderful colony of axenic animals. And so um, everyone was agreeing that work could be done there. Um, and the committee uh, could not stop it because nothing was written in their uh, papers saying we were doing wrong. Uh, but then the direction of the, of the INRA said, oh, maybe there is something still because it's speaking of religion, it's speaking of, about lots of weird stuff, so we just have to stop it for well, no reason, but we have to stop it. <laughs> so it's very interesting because um, they, they were thinking the committee would be enough uh, to stop us, but, but they were not. Actually, the, um, the scientists and, and, the, and the ethical committees were very happy to, to deal with that kind of thing. And they even created a new research uh, to see how would the other mice react in front of uh, sanctified uh, mice. I mean smelling mice, <laughs> so, so they were even interested to go further. But then the, the direction said no. So this is, this is quite fascinating because they had no reason, but they are still fearing something coming from the art. Well, this is a good transition. I mean, Rob, is, Rob Bernstein is back. So you are familiar with Marion's and uh, Benoit's practice. You have been talking a lot about immunology, about uh, holy mice, uh, Holy Coli project and other microbiome related research. So there was always a fascination to bring the artist also here because of your own research. Can you maybe contextualize your research also in the light of the practices that Marion and Benoit have been just elaborating on? Sure. So um, initially, I have to say I was rather skeptical of what they were doing. They were certainly pushing the boundaries, and a lot of it didn't make very much sense to me. But over the last few years, the research I've been doing on autoimmune diseases and what is self um, actually has made a lot of sense of what they're doing. And their work actually makes a lot of sense to me, raising very interesting and important questions. So uh, if we can go to the second slide, I can't see the slide. So if what I'm saying doesn't make any sense, somebody wave at me or something like that. Um, so the second slide should be Ruma Comics. Art has actually been a part of autoimmune disease research from the very inception, in part because uh, one of the problems for anybody doing research is understanding what's going on in someone else's body. And so we actually have to get ourselves mentally into other people to understand. And then the people who have autoimmune diseases themselves often uh, do art. So on the left, you've got uh, a painting of basically what a person with an autoimmune disease conceives their immune system doing. They conceive their body as a uh, castle and the immune system as a, as a sort of uh, military force which is supposed to protect it against uh, foreign invaders, except in this case, the immune system is having a civil war and it's actually fighting itself. Uh, on the right, you've got a painting of what a person with lupus feels that the lupus is doing to them. And this is very interesting because there's the clinical, here's the data, and then there's the whole thing of living it. And these are two completely different ways of understanding what autoimmune diseases are, which I think anybody who has to live with it or treat it actually needs to put together. 
So just briefly, my research is all about autoimmune diseases. If I can have the next slide. Uh, there are over 80 that are currently known. There are probably well over uh, 100, and there may be many more than that. We keep discovering them every year. Um, each one is a discrete disease with a discrete set of symptoms. They can affect any organ, body, any tissue. Uh, some of them target very specific cell types. Some of them target the entire body, as lupus can do. Um, some people get one autoimmune disease, some get multiple autoimmune diseases serially, some of them all at the same time. Um, and the one thing that characterizes all of them as a group is your own immune system, instead of protecting you against disease, is an actual cause of disease. It's attacking you. So next slide. What I'd like to do is sort of give you a sense of how the immune system works. So Marion talked about becoming other things, other, in this case, another organism, one of the things that scientists sometimes do, I certainly do it all the time, is to try to become the objects that are involved in the disease. So I imagine myself as a T-cell receptor. I imagine myself as a virus invading the body um, and then try to figure out what these different things are going to do. So I'm going to try to explain to you how I think about these things in a totally visual way, which is sort of how I conceive of it in my head. This is obviously an abstraction of that. But So the critical things that determine who you are from an immuno immunological point of view are, are the T cells. So these are cells that float around your body, and they mediate whether your body will respond to something as foreign or whether they will not respond to it because they think it's self. That's obviously very simplified, uh, but basically you have uh, shapes. And so at the top you have there a T cell receptor, which has been expressed as an as a abstraction. Um, it fits into and recognizes some foreign material, which we call an antigen. So this is any non-self, uh, you know, it could be a virus, it could be a bacteria, whatever it happens to be. If a non-self material and a T-cell receptor are literally complementary uh, in, in shape, uh, that will activate whatever cells have that T-cell, and they clone themselves. So they make many, many copies, uh, as you can see on the right, uh, so many copies, they overwhelm whatever the invading pathogen is, and they get rid of it. So that's a standard immune response. Can I have the next slide, please? So our research in the last few years, and this was actually occurring contemporaneously with my discussions with Benoit and Marion, um, was uh, involved looking at what those T cell receptors are doing because although they mediate self, we really don't understand what self is in an immunological sense. And our laboratory made a really interesting discovery. In the first place, it turned out that every T cell receptor in your, your immune system mimicked proteins in your body. And so this came, led us to come up with the idea that basically your immune system is sort of a second self. All of the proteins in your body are simplified and expressed in the immune system, and it becomes sort of like a uh, way of misdirecting an immune response. So an immune response has to get into your tissues or your cells to create havoc. If you have a bunch of things that look like the immune system but aren't, and they're present in many, many copies, then these foreign invaders are going to attack them instead. But it's sort of like if you've ever seen a, you know, aircraft fighting each other, they'll leave, leave a trail of chaff which is to misdirect the, the missiles and so forth. That's what's going on here. They're trying to misdirect where those pathogens go, and then there's a system, they bind them up and they kill them off. Well, the other thing that we discovered at the same time, which is on the left-hand side, was every time we looked at a T-cell receptor, it also looked like proteins in your microbiome. So all of those bacteria and fungi and other things that normally live on your skin, in your body, actually mimic, again, your T-cell receptors. And so one of the things that that implies is that your immune system doesn't recognize them as foreign. It's mimicking them. Mim mimicking them. So your, um, your microbiome exists as part of you because it looks like you. 
So in a sense, we have three systems here, which is really interesting. Each one doing pretty much the same thing. We have your genetic you. We have your immune system, which sort of mimics it and protects you. And then we have your microbiome, which is allowed to live on you because it looks like you. Your immune system doesn't recognize it as foreign. So going to the bottom half of the slide then, what now happens is, whoops, I can't see my own slides here. Um, that if you have a foreign antigen, a pathogen of some kind, um, then your immune system obviously tries to take care of it. Uh, what actually then defines a pathogen is its ability to interact with your proteins, which is on the bottom uh, right. And on the left, it turns out that your any pathogen will also attack your microbiome. You are not the only target of an infection. So every time you get infected, your microbiome changes. And in fact, your microbiome can therefore act as, in a sense, a second immune system. When it's healthy, it's very hard for you to get sick. When your microbiome is sick, then pathogens get in and make you sick too. All right, next slide. So what we now have are a bunch of different mimics, and autoimmune diseases turn out to uh, be caused in part by the fact that some pathogens have figured this out. So now they want to get past the immune system, they want to get past that healthy microbiome to get at your cells so they can attack them. So what do they do? They evolve to look like all of those things. They actually look like, in some cases, your microbiome um, bacteria or viruses, they mimic your own T cell receptors, and they therefore can interact with and uh, mimic parts of your proteins in your tissues. That means that when you create an antibody response to that pathogen, bottom half of the slide here, that antibody unfortunately can also recognize your cells it can recognize your T cells, so your immune system can actually attack the other part of your immune system. Antibodies attacking T cells, and those antibodies can attack your microbiome. This is autoimmunity. In autoimmune disease, a pathogen tricks the immune system into attacking you, but it's also attacking your immune system. And in every autoimmune disease, we have specific parts of your microbiome that get destroyed. So when Marion was talking about taking another microbiome, putting it into herself, this is actually something people are experimenting with as a treatment for autoimmune diseases, since particular parts of the microbiome are killed off in each distinct autoimmune disease, replacing those missing parts of the microbiome are, it might, is considered a possible treatment for autoimmunity. So all of that actually makes sense. So to summarize here, immunology is all about recognition of shapes. Proteins look like proteins in your body, look like proteins in your immune system, look like proteins in pathogens, look like proteins in your microbiome. So this is some of my early artwork about this. I try to explore how different shapes interact, intersect, and do various things. So finally, just to sort of address some of the other things that Benoit and Marion were talking about, um, specifically the horse uh, project, it's interesting from an immunologist's point of view to then think about, you know, who are we? So next slide down here, with passive immunization, if we're on that one. Um, if you go back in the history of immunology, you find that one of the first cures or treatments for diphtheria and a number of other diseases was passive immunization uh, with horse serious. So basically what they would do is they take diphtheria uh, toxin, which is fatal to us, that's what kills little kids if they're not immunized. They put it into a horse, which turns out to be resistant to it, but it will make antibodies. So you put a whole bunch into a horse, inoculate it multiple times to get lots of antibody production. You then bleed the horse, separate out the serum, which has all the antibodies in it, and basically the same thing that Marion was doing, you then inoculate it into a person, in this case, to treat or prevent their diphtheria. 
So this actually won a Nobel Prize in 1912. This is, was a major thing. But from this modern immunological point of view that I've been talking about, this should, as Marianne was talking about, change who you are. So next slide. And it does. So Marion is actually still at risk, even though the experiment is over. She's no longer trying to be a horse. She is a horse inside. And people who had this horse serum, many years later, if they accidentally ate horse meat, would sometimes have anaphylactic shock. Same thing you might get if you're allergic to bees or peanuts or something like that. So Marion actually has to be careful for the rest of her life because if she actually eats horse meat by accident and there are places in Europe which serve it, there could be a serious problem. There, in fact, are other ways in which things happen like that. You can become allergic to meat by getting a tick bite. We're not quite sure. It's probably carrying some kind of virus. But your immune system is sufficient to actually alter who you are and how you respond to what you eat and what you run into. So this whole idea of becoming the horse is in fact really what's going on. And if I go to the next slide, which I believe is my last one, the really important parts are, here are that our, our whole reductionist viewpoint of the world where everything is determined by our genes and all these gene tests we're doing today is completely wrong. We are not just our genes. Our immune systems mediate the genetics. They also mediate the microbiome. Our genetics helps determine what microbiome we have, but that's also determined, as Marion pointed out, by what you eat, where you live, um, what kind of fecal matter you run into, um, what, your what kind of microbiome your mother passes on to you. And so lots of people today are now talking about this, uh, uh, that we're, we are not... Uh, an individual anymore. We are what they're calling a holobiont, that we are an entire e ecological system. And that ecological system is very complex, constantly changing. We are evolving throughout our lives from everything we eat, everything that we create an immune response to, um, all the other people we run into because they pass on their germs to us and we pass them on to them. So we are never just ourselves. We are never, um, you know, just staying in place. Um, we are this interactive thing which interacts with the world and everyone else we come in contact. So eating, injecting, everything changes us. And so really what I love about what Benoit and uh, Marion have been doing is they're questioning what makes us us, or if we can even talk about an us. And from an immunologist's point of view, I would agree. I am at the point where I'm asking, who are we? And how do we know who we are at any given time? So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bob. We are running out of time, and the, we are at the high risk to actually miss the opening if you're not <laughs> carrying on and missing the horse in representation. So we are also coming back to other kind of species-related issues here with the next uh, part of this panel, which is actually Kwai Shen and Linda Hansen. So Kwai Shen has an actually an exhibition uh, in the exhibition a piece where and are collaborating with us in order to make music, to make it short. Uh, there is a kind of social system, which is a whole ecology, where uh, processes that we might identify as scratching are actually performed by the leaf cutter ants on spot. So we have Kwai Shine here, and here is an artist who has been working with ants as models, as social systems for many, many years. It is multimedia artworks, and together on this panel with Linda Hansen, um, research plant pathologist and adjunct associate professor in the Department of Plant, Soil, and Microbial Science here at Michigan State, Michigan State University. So I don't want to lose further time and just pass it over to Kwai first. Um, I don't know if we need this. Well, you probably need this. We do? It's a, so okay. it's a small audience. I don't know. Um, I think it's for recording. Oh yes, for recording. Um, is this a 
Ramon? Okay, so um, I am the less prepared, I guess, from all the this magnificent artist uh, constellation participating at Matters Matters for this presentation. I didn't put up too many slides. Um, and Linda actually has helped me with the research of uh, during the residency part of uh, my project. Uh, we held a couple of interesting conversations and she also provided material for growing some of the bacteria that lives in the body of the ants that I work with, the leaf cutter ants. Uh, and I will show you basically um, so, so first of all, I would like to I will keep it short, and I will show you just some images um, using uh, SEM microscopes, uh, scanning electron microscopes. Um, so these are secondary electron images um, of amplifying the certain parts of the body, the social organs of the ants. Uh, I wanted to just to perhaps do a sort of like a two-way conversation more than a monologue me first and then Linda. Um, so I guess it would be interesting to start with Linda's research itself because the connection is that um, Linda has been working with um, actinomycetes and fungi, fungi and my ants happen to, um, or the, the colonies that I've been working with, the families of ants, they happen to cultivate a fungus garden uh, of the genus Leucocoprinus. And it so happens that they also host actinomycetes in their bodies that produce antibiotics. Uh, and this is the research that I've been doing here, um, antibiotica or antibiotics. <laughs> um, and some of these anti actinomycetes have ways of expressing themselves, which are, uh, could be amplified aesthetically or could be observed or uh, perhaps they perform their own aesthetics in their own way uh, by interacting with other ecological factors. Um, and it's interesting to connect that to the microbiome, the conversation before and to autoimmune system. So maybe um, you can explain a little bit more about your research. Okay, my own research is um, looking at interactions between plants and particularly fungi, but also some actinomycetes and bacteria uh, for both disease, I'm in a plant pathology department, but also cases where you don't get disease and cases where th we might call it disease. So actinomycetes in particular cause something we call potato scab. That's, you can see a picture up here. It makes it potatoes unmarketable, but it actually doesn't harm the potato at all. Uh, and they're per actually perfectly safe to eat as well. Uh, and actually, if it's not in an expanding tissue, so on standard roots, you can get the same infection, and it actually can benefit the uh, plant. We use these as biocontrol because they produce antibiotics, which can uh, limit growth of pathogens. They can also, let's see, where's our name? Um, well, they also can uh, produce co uh, compounds to take up iron from the environment, make it more available both to themselves and the plant and compete with some other organisms. So they can, in many situations, they're plant beneficials, but in a very few situations, and it actually happens to be only when the root tissue is expanding and we think it's ugly that uh, they are detrimental to the plant or detrimental to the system. Um, they're also interesting, they produce a lot of different compounds, a lot of the antibiotics we use in medicine are from the actinomycetes, and also they produce the smell when you have that fresh soil after rain, actually that's not the soil, that's the act actinomycetes in the soil producing these compounds that give that smell. Isn't this also a, a streptomyces driven smell or produced by streptomyces? Majorly or also mostly other? in the it's mostly the streptomyces and, and other actinomyces. Yeah, so, so these are these are streptomyces leaves also in the body of the ants and yeah. uh, maybe there's the yeah, exactly here. So there's a lot and they produce a lot of different types. E each of these is a different type of, of actinomycete. They produce spores. You have to use a scanning electron microscope to see them. They're very small, but these are we use them to tell what species are involved in the different situations. And uh, yeah. these... And I've, so these are yeah. cultured in um, different uh, media? 
Yeah. Uh, you brought some of those. I don't know if the <laughs> same amount, the red one is actually a malt agar medium, and the other one is? That is a V8 vegetable juice medium. But the interesting part of this, me uh, this agar medium is that it's not originally red, mm -hmm. but it turns red because it's a form of, it's an expression by the nutrients of the malt and the agar. Yeah. So the and that was some of our initial talking about what you grow these on can have a big impact on how they look and how they interact with their environment. So you can actually see on the left there, depending on the media, when you see the red pigmentation in that particular case, that's actually iron coming out of the media. So we use it to look at some of these interactions, but it was also of interest for... Uh, <laughs> yeah, sort of like experimentation um, in terms of the visual augmentation. I like to work with the technologies that amplify cert certain, certain social gestures in the modes of existence of ants with other beings and materials. That's one of the, the sort of like where the place where I am, where I've always been in my attraction to ants. And I see them as a, more than an ant colony, as a multi-species community. Uh, oh, that's a pity that the other video is not playing. But these are, this is just uh, visual experiments. I have tons of images. Uh, these are, this, is, this was taken four years ago in my studio where I keep a leaf cutter ant colony of the Atacephalotes, and you can see how they groom the poopy, uh, which is supposed to be a major just by telling it by size and by my experience. While at the same time you have all clustered together a uh, substrate, the leaf, the green part that they are also cleaning up the surface of the leaf before they offer it to the fungus. You don't see the fungus garden because it's in the backdrop. But this um, sort of like clustered, entangled uh, social gestures, I like to call them, uh, where you cannot really focus on one sp single species. You will have to repeat the video once again. I sample basically for my research parts of the different uh, parts of the body of the ants. And you can see on the bottom right, so I'm taken with, uh, with a microscope um, where you can see uh, just a colored uh, purple media. This is just uh, uh, produced by light uh, just to uh, augment, the, to uh, increase the contrast. And these are apparently, double check with Linda, these are probably, we cannot be certain, actinomycetes themselves. Um, and from those images, I culture many, picture, uh, many uh, bacteria from the body of the ants. Uh, oh, there is the video. Anyway, this is a video of a major of, um, major is a cast, the so-called cast, is a sister, bigger sister in the ant colony. And these are some experiments, visual experiments I do for another project called Plectrum, um, which is connected to the exhibition that we will go see um, based on the stridulation of ants and aspergillus on the, on the bottom, on the backdrop. Um, aspergillus is not part of the microbiome of the ants, but this was just one of the first experiments. Um, so these sample cultures, so I use, um, I was also collaborating here at MSU with the Ad Center for Advanced Microscopy, where we, do, we took these pictures using the scanning electron microscope. So these are parts of the leaf cutter ants, uh, atacephalotes, and you can see on the top left uh, a magnifying image of, what do you think that is? Let's make it interactive. <laughs> That's the tarsus, that's the end of one of the legs, the foreleg of the ant. Um, they have this sort of claws and all these um, hairs that come out of it um, and the pores, it's a very eerie structure. And on the uh, top right, you will see a magnification of the top part of that leg where within, in between the claws that served as grasping tool for the ants and they grasp many things and hold on to many surfaces, you will see that inner part is these tiny like particles, these tiny spheres. Um, those are actually bacteria, unknown bacteria, uh, that live there. So it's pretty much the same that if we would do the same with some cultures of in between our legs, or our fingers, I would say. On the bottom right, on the bottom left, sorry, uh, you will see this is known as the tarsal notch, um, which is composed by bristles, brushes, and a comb, so it's basically a comb. And they do this, this is also part of the foreleg of the ant. Uh, this is uh, in, essential for cleaning themselves, so it's a self-grooming tool. Um, but it also, they use those legs, the tarsus, and this tarsal notch um, to 
offer to, to, to place the leaf uh, substrate on the fungus garden. You can also see that if you're attentive enough in the exhibition, there, they, you will see the, this, this sort of fungus and pruning and activity. And on the bottom right, you will see um, a magnification of that comb, the tarsal notch. You can identify uh, the picture where it's placed. Um, and you can see these uh, bigger spheres, bigger objects, circular spherical objects are actually not bacteria. The bigger ones are um, what we think it's um, pollen from different, they, these ants are in constant touch, touching many different vegetative uh, organisms. Uh, going around, picking up many things, and as you can see in this high uh, magnification image, all these hairs and their bodies, uh, it's a landscape that basically gets entangled with many things. But these smaller, smaller, tiny things in between the combs, the strains of the combs, I don't know if you can notice, I don't have a pointer, those are bacteria. So there's also always places that will be inhabitable by other beings that we don't see unless we have the technology that amplifies that. On the top left, you will see this is part of the integumental cavity, and all this kind of porosity structure, pore structure, enables the bacteria on the top right is actinomycid uh, bacteria that grows sort of like a mesh uh, extending itself. Um, and then you can see also another magnified uh, image of the previous uh, one uh, on the bottom left, all these uh, spheres, um, spherical beings are bacteria deposited in the tarsus of the ant. On the bottom right, you will see also other bacteria, but in this, uh, this, in this image is actually taken at the gaster, which is the abdomen of the ant. So it's just magnifying using uh, the SEM technology to see all the places where the bacteria live. And this is actually the spores of the, of, the, of the actinomycid, which I wouldn't say if it's, couldn't be able to say if it's streptomyces of pseudonocardia, but I've been taking these pictures sort of like to make myself aware of how the levels of interaction of the ants that perhaps cannot be represented, not visible, not smellable, that you cannot listen to, but unless you have these technologies of amplification, and from there on, you could perhaps use other media to cross over uh, other ways of performing with them. So that's the, the stage where I am at this moment um, with the project of antibiotics. Um, experiment a little bit visually with the SEM's images, uh, perhaps to replicate that in different forms of structures that could be not captured permanently, uh, like in this case with images, but make them perform by entangling them with other artifacts, other beings, and other technologies. So I'm experimenting at the moment with those, these images. And perhaps, Linda, I would like to ask you, how do you know all these filaments? How do you, what are they for, actually? This is, for instance, a culture. This is, you cannot, this is an expression. I, that's how I call it. It's probably not correct. Um, um, but this is part of the filaments that grow out of the actinomyces that live in the ants. And I found that really fascinating how they different this, this way that they basically look for substrate. Is it that the, the reason why they, they create the filaments, to look for nutrients? It's partly nutrients, it's other factors as well, sometimes um, nutrients, water. Um, in some cases, they're actually growing away from something else. Mm. So if you actually have two organisms in there, you may have antibiosis. So you can have both a um, growth towards something and a growth away from something. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, they're just, you do have growth. If you have enough nutrient, you'll continue to grow. And in many cases, you'll see them growing in all directions. Mm -hmm. So those are forces of attraction and repulsion, yes. right? Yes. So I like to see that as sort of like relations that unfold depending on the ecological niche, depending on this self, non-self perhaps, all these interactions. So I like to touch upon all those things, um, sort of like on top epistemologies that um, just by looking at the ants and keeping caring for them, um, just uh, uh, sort of like emerge and arise um, from, from those interactions. Um, this is also another picture this is all coming from the ants, and that's why I like um, to explain uh, or to base. So this is, if you, you show these pictures without context, that you 
pretty much have no clue what they come from or what they are. And partially, it's also interesting to not know what they are because I cannot really taxonomically identify these species. But I know because I label them throughout the process of culturing and sampling. These come from um, the same integument cavity of the ant, which, by the way, it's sort of like this underneath the, the, the neck of the ant, the leaf culture ant. That's where they, most of the bacteria uh, that produce antibiotics live. Um, but they, they also host black yeast, which is another kind of Please, please help me if, if I'm not, I don't want to make a mistake. So yeast belong to? Their fungi. Their fungi, exactly. Yeah. And so this is a fungi living also there. But it's not the fungus garden. It's not the fungi strain that they cultivate to feed on, uh, which is interesting. So and this shape and this form, how they, it's, it's taken. This is taken on the surface of a Petri dish, um, this image. Um, it's, it's a colony, of course, um, but it's also a single being that it's uh, multiple at the same time, I would like to say. So it's interesting just by seeing these things, how, how microscopic ecologies just live within other ecologies and uh, it's just taken from a single ant. But this ant is just looks the same as the other ants and these other ants are living together and some people call this a superorganism and they can be amplified with piezoelectricity to hear how they sound and they can be interconnected to computer vision programs to track their movements, that they produce other movements that enact mechanisms, and that's basically what my installation is about. And these are images of Omigas, the installation now being shown at the site um, in different contexts, in different exhibitions, and um, hopefully you can hear them singing. Can you explain briefly, I mean, at least in two minutes, maybe, how these ecologies are related and how they can be experienced? Uh, related to the project itself. Um, yes, um, these are ways, I, I deem these technoecologies. Um, I like to combine different reports in technological artifacts by my own means, sort of like uh, using the DIY approach, um, experimenting and testing things to, um, to sense other modes of existence of other social beings, in this case, of course, the ants themselves. And, the installation itself, it's quite complex because it never, you will never hear the same sounds, the same scratching sounds. So basically the idea to combine turntables with um, contact microphones that amplify the acoustic communication of these ants um, was because uh, I was sort of like by trial and error mixing different techniques and exploring ways to um, sort of like create a sonic landscape of the ants walking around when then suddenly were producing other sounds that were different than just having ants crawling around a microphone. And then just by connecting with other people that were working with ants and um, the ecology of ants, specifically one um, friend of mine in Ecuador that was working with the, the ecology of ants and how they affect other ecologies, he told me about, did you know that they have an organ that produces acoustic vibration? I told him, I didn't know. And then he showed me some pictures of a book of the, using SEM at, um, microscopes of the organ itself, and I was blown away. So I started uh, placing the microphone in specific where they cut the leaves, for instance, they start to stridulate. When they are around the fungus, they also start to stridulate, and it's a sort of like an orchestration that is triggered by different um, influence, uh, internal influence, intra-relationship uh, between the fungus, the, the ants, the ants themselves, and, well, perhaps speculate about their own feelings, how their own microbiota, the actinomycetes in themselves. Well, it's not really internal. It's more external in their body, but they keep licking themselves with their combs, um, the tarsal notch that I was showing, the tarsus. They are very tactile. How that can be expressed in terms of something that you cannot permanently capture. And this uh, scratching of the turntables is triggered by a computer vision program that monitors the movement of the ants. Together with the piezo microphones, you will hear the sounds of the ants, the stridulation, acoustic vibration, in sort of like in creative tension with the turntable itself, which is a cultural artifact of musical production that happens to be something that decodes the vinyl. The vinyl is grooves that are coded in the, in the vinyl, the music record itself. Um, and the scratching effect basically um, sounds similar to the stridulation. So you have this, and it also creates heat, it creates a soundscape that is never permanent, but it's always performing. 
and it's all mediated by, by these living organisms. So, we hope to have you all over there for this session of microperformativity later on, where different material agencies come together. Um, I think we have to go on because we still have a very fascinating presentation by Cecil Tolas, and I would just like to ask the question whether we need another break or whether we should just go on. How do you feel about that? Oh, you mean, I mean, it's good before to go to see the space to have your, your input. I mean, should we break for, for really five minutes? And what is it? Huh? One minute? Just one, two minutes break. Okay. Thank you.